you. My name is Andy Davidhazy, and uh, technically speaking, I'm, a, an, I'm an amateur photographer and a professional designer of mostly useful things. I believe that the, uh, that the way we, we view and understand the world around us uh, informs the quality and the impact of our work. And so what I thought I would do is, is share uh, a few stories about how empathy and uh, human sort of understanding has impacted my work and, 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 my, and my life. And, and that's kind of where this title comes from. Um, I wanted to kind of start by sharing a video with you. It was produced by uh, BBC Media Action a couple of years ago, a video that was part of a campaign in support of the Syrian refugee crisis. I thought this was a really great example of how um, we can help uh, each other connect with other people and, 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 and build empathy for their uh, unique sort of needs and fears and aspirations and to see what it's like to walk in somebody else's shoes, quite literally. So I've put together some of my work and experiences and I, I've organized them into kind of three, three parts. Uh, first being about observation which is to uh, build a deep understanding for other people through personal experience and immersion. Um, uh, transformation, which is how we transform human insights into viable solutions that, that kind of meet their needs. And inspiration, which is how we can give greater meaning to our work and to other people. Uh, how many people flew in for the conference? Raise your, raise your hand. OK, quite a bit. Now, how many people prefer sitting in the aisle seat? Raise your hand. Aisle seats. How many aisle seats? And then how many people prefer the window seat? <coughs> a few more people. Now, I saw some people didn't raise their hand. And you guys are the ones that are usually in the middle seat, the least prepared, saving everything for the last minute and, and such. <laughs> um, anyway, there's plenty of scientific studies about sort of the psychology of where it is we choose to sit on an airplane. You know, whether that you're kind of introverted or extroverted, you might sit on the window if you like to kind of nest or sleep. Or, you know, people on the aisle maybe tend to be more extroverted, like to socialize and have complete control over everything that happens in their row. And that's you. You know, the designers of airplanes and airplane seats could do uh, a lot better to solve for some of these needs if they put passengers first. What I, I love to sit on the window seat, and some of those other reasons are true, but my main motivation for wanting to sit on the window is because I am completely transfixed by what's happening on the ground beneath us. And I just love flying over uh, places, whether it be cities or, or sort of barren sort of landscapes, and trying to imagine what it's like to be down there right at that particular moment in time. And if somebody were to design a really great product or experience for me as a flyer, it would be 
uh, to, to, to have a, an app or a device that would tell me exactly what's happening on the ground as we're flying over it in real time. You know, are there people down there? If there are, what are they doing? What's the temperature? And are these people okay? You know, uh, I love flying over Greenland. It's probably my favorite. You can kind of see the, how the ice flows like rivers. And it just seemed really cold, and I wonder what it's like to be there. This is a photo I took uh, last year uh, flying out of uh, Mongolia. These pictures I took when I was 12 years old, uh, high-speed photographs. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with this kind of work. Um, but like I said at the beginning, I grew up at RIT, and I was surrounded by my father's sort of photographic invention and sort of all this sort of weird science that was happening. Um, and I wrote an article uh, about high-speed photography that appeared at the end of uh, uh, a, a Boy's Life magazine. They're made with uh, a Polaroid camera, uh, a sound synchronizer. You can see the little microphone in the top picture there, and uh, a strobe light. And there's a great deal of sort of anticipation and suspense involved in making pictures like these. Uh, and they, because they have to be made in complete darkness too. And this was all rather new to me. And so I would spend a lot of time before I even took a picture just trying to make sure everything was set up properly, that uh, the cables were connected, that the car was going where it was supposed to go, that the little needle I had taped to the hood uh, would stay intact and the balloon would pop and everything would work. And and so all this is kind of going on, but it's not really until that first moment when I turn off the lights and it goes dark that I really kind of understood now um, my father's world, you know, what he's been doing all this time that I'm not seeing him. And in that moment, I could, I could kind of really connect from, uh, with what he was doing, his point of view, and, and, and some of his work. And so that was, that was kind of cool. When I see this picture, this is another thing from kind of my youth, uh, but uh, I love to make uh, scale models of these elaborate sort of rock concert stages of my heroes. You know, Van Halen and Kiss were my sort of childhood sort of uh, idols, and they had these huge elaborate sort of concert stages with fires and lights and all these things. And I made scale models of these things. And I think I just like doing this because I could better imagine what it was like to stand on that stage staring out into an audience uh, a little bit bigger than this one. And so I went on to, uh, instead of kind of finishing college, I went on to move to Los Angeles to play uh, guitar in some rock bands of my own. And although I didn't achieve any sort of rock stardom, I, I ended up in Seattle designing sets and building sets for the Seattle Shakespeare Festival and other kind of regional theater groups. And, um, but one important thing that I learned is that no matter how nice you design sort of a stage, it doesn't mean anything without an audience. It doesn't mean anything without people. Um, I really love photographs that kind of really draw you in. Um, they beg a question. It was such a famous photograph for probably the same reasons why I love it. That, uh, you know, it was a, it was a moment uh, in, in history that was full of suspense and drama and we can see it on the faces of some of the people in, in this photograph. Um, and I just, you know, you look at this and you just wonder what are these folks thinking? So I, I just love photographs that do that, that, that force you to ask a, a question about what, what's going on there. Um, and then there's a photograph here of this sort of grizzled uh, sort of man uh, who's about to, who's at the beginning of a five month long hike through the mountain wilderness. And so again, you know, you might look at a picture like this and wonder, you know, what's going on with this, with this guy? You know, is he just trying to escape reality? And, you know, is he afraid of what lies ahead? You know, and who is he really? And uh, so, as everybody knows, this, this, this picture is of me. And it's just five years ago. But I had no idea who he was. Um, so whether it's from far away, or whether it's from up close. As photographers, we, we really affect how people interpret the world around us. And I grew up around photography, as you kind of know, but it wasn't until uh, 2005 when my father sent me a 60-year-old Leica 3B uh, rangefinder film camera. And uh, once I could kind of figure out how to load the thing, and I saw 
these rather poor pictures that I took with it, uh, I completely fell in love with the tone uh, that, that was visible in the, in the film, and I fell in love with sort of this really uh, laborious sort of process involved with just making uh, a photograph. And, uh, and so like much of you, I, I just take pictures of stuff that interests me, whether that's hanging out with friends and family, um, whether it's traveling and sort of wandering the streets and seeing what's happening, um, whether that's bicycle racing, uh, cyclocross racing in Texas, um, and then the community of people that surrounds sort of this, this, uh, this sport. Um, the uh, unfolding drama, if you will, of sort of the human condition. I love sort of capturing that in, and, uh, in some way or another. People at their best moments, people at their worst <coughs> moments. And this is me getting caught in a, in a riot that was happening in Washington, D.C. You know, immersing myself in things that make me uncomfortable. Uh, I do that quite a bit. And in things that make me really proud. And uh, I do that as well, and uh, make pictures. So, but I don't make pictures for the living. Um, but what I do do is I observe things for a living. And that's very much a part of, of my job. I've been working in design for a good 25 years or so. I work closely with teams of, of designers, whether it be graphic designers or, or uh, UX designers or, or architects and, and writers and researchers and all kinds of other uh, folks. And as a creative director, um, one of my main responsibilities is for the approach that we take to finding innovative solutions to all kinds of different, uh, you know, developing a new brand, an identity, uh, or a marketing uh, campaign or a new product or service or environment, such as a retail store or a hotel, um, or a, a user experience or a mobile application or all kinds of things. But yet I don't consider myself an expert in any particular industry. But I do have some expertise in sort of the process in which you go through to design things. You may have heard the term sort of human-centered design. And all that is is sort of a creative methodology for uh, for problem solving that is based upon a deep empathy for the people you're designing for and arriving at solutions that meet their needs. It, it doesn't really matter what it is, I apply the same kind of design thinking to anything that I'm doing. And sort of broadly outlined that involves three things. One is understanding what challenge we're trying to solve for and who we're trying to solve it for. Um, uh, second is to explore uh, ideas that translate those, those sort of human insights and, and challenges into viable solutions and prototypes that we can kind of test and get feedback on and to implement uh, your design by bringing it to life and be able to assess how it's working as you, after you've done so. And so there's innovative firms. IDEO is maybe one you've heard of. Ziva Design in Portland, Oregon, where I used to be a creative director for a few years. Um, they design products and experiences um, for some of the, the biggest and most influential brands in the world. And they design things that we interact with every, every day. It was there that I really learned how to codify uh, the work and you know, improve upon and codify the work that I've always been doing to make the outcome of design and the process of designing things much more reliable and repeatable. So you have you know, big companies that invest millions and millions of dollars in, in, in developing a new product and bringing that to market. And so if they're going to make those kinds of investments and take those kinds of risks, it's really important that there's an integrity and a rigor to the process in which you go through to, to figure out what that product should be. And, you know, uh, and so that's, uh, I spend quite a bit of time with our teams just on that sort of design sort of strategy. But I realized around this time that learning how to walk in other people's shoes was tremendously valuable to me and, and my career. And so if that's sort of the methodology, sort of the what was to really connect brands and products with their target audience and customers and users. And our goal as communicators is to develop a shared understanding between these two for what is important and what is meaningful. To always ask why to get at sort of underlying motivations and, and, uh, and values that people have. 
some of you, whether you're in-house or you uh, work independently, uh, we're consultants. We're, we're in the service sort of industry. We're, we're trying to communicate and develop, whether it's pictures or images or illustrations that help communicate some of these things. And so I know that in my experience, uh, I, working with a, a lot of different agencies and teams, there tends to be a lot of negative sort of uh, energy surrounding clients. That they tend to be seen as sort of the obstructionists of something great and beautiful and brilliant. And if, and if only the client would get out of the way, those things would be true. Um, but I happen to really love clients for two reasons. One is that they bring challenges and problems to me that I would never impose upon myself. And I find that interesting and I find that uh, a really great sort of opportunity. It's our responsibility to defend the needs of sort of the end consumer. And so it's really important that you and your client understand who those people are and you think about that the same way. So I'm going to share a few different uh, design projects with you. Uh, and the first, I'm going to go back to kind of the beginning of my career. So I was working as a creative uh, or a graphic designer at a small ad agency in Silicon Valley, in Palo Alto. They were rebranding themselves, so we had a new logo and, and the, the owners of the small firm wanted to do a, a promotional mailing. But you know, who really cares about an agency's new logo? Nobody. And so in trying to come up with sort of a concept or an idea that would allow us to kind of touch people and I wanted to do something that would surprise and delight people and would interest them uh, aside from sort of a logo mark. You know, make it something that people felt like they wanted to keep and hold on to. You know, our clients tended to be people in technology, big tech companies and much higher in IQ than EQ. And so, you know, uh, appealing to people's sort of intellect was sort of a, a good place to kind of uh, start. You'll, you'll notice here that the, the logo that was designed is an M, a W, and an A. The name of the firm was MWA Creative. And after I kind of designed this mark, I kind of looked at it and I go, well, geez, it kind of looks like a, an ancient hieroglyph. Uh, and it actually resembles the hieroglyph for water. But what I thought I would do is um, concoct a story about this mark and its presence throughout history, this rather mysterious and curious presence throughout history. And I placed it in factual history. So there was research involved and a card that had this long story and all these different sort of examples of how this mark showed up throughout history. You know, it was discovered in the Rosetta Stone and people understood its mere meaning of, of being a symbol of great sort of power. And the, our Freemasons, uh, you know, discovered it and adopted it as an icon of their own. Einstein talked about it in his lectures. Uh, people don't know this, but the baseball bat that Babe Ruth used had this in it. And that inspired the movie The Natural with, with Robert Redford, as you all know. And in fact, I used, uh, I was inspired by some work that my father did using infrared photography to look through layers of paint in old paintings to see how an artist sort of changed or modified their work as they, as they went. And so that became uh, the subject of a Leonardo da Vinci painting where you could clearly see that in an earlier version of this painting, he had scribbled this mark. It, it activated people's imagination and it imprinted our brand upon people's uh, sort of psyche. And they remembered the work and, and they held on to it. So leapfrogging quite a bit forward, uh, working with Boeing on, on, on this particular project was the first time that my work was going to involve four-star generals and heads of state and, and other things. So trying to really kind of understand these people was going to be a new challenge for me. And so the, the project was that Boeing, the, the, the Space Defense and Security Division of Boeing, uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C., uh, they wanted a place to be able to bring their customers to show off new products and to have meetings and make plans and stuff from the architecture to the service to the communications to all of the technical interactions and stuff that would happen. It needed to be open, so it was a place that people could self-discover, and but it also needed to be highly confidential and secretive. You, know, you had people from all different cultures uh, and traditions and languages that were coming to this facility. People would arrive and have entourages with them. So if somebody shows up and now you got 10 other people that aren't really involved in these meetings, but what do you do with these people? Visiting the F-18 plant in St. Louis, you know, you walk into this plant where they make these, these airplanes and very serious kind of stuff and highly technical, but you walk into this facility and it looks like it's not what you expect. It looks like somebody's garage, you know, a workshop. It has tables and benches and shelves and 
tools, me mechanical things. And so that was kind of interesting. But the other thing that was going on is this place was spotless. It's the kind of wall that you would hang up plaques or the employee of the week kind of a wall, right? Showing uh, what they called FOD, which is foreign object debris. A little speck of something or a piece of dirt that was tracked into the facility. And it would end up in this bag and paste it up on this wall. It goes back to a brand's values. And we can start to bring that out in sort of the design of what we do. You think about experience in, in kind of two key dimensions. One is time, something that happens over a period of time, before, during, and after. Uh, but it also happens uh, via distance, which is how close you are to something. You know, first moment of truth, second moment of truth, third moment of truth. I think everybody probably understands that kind of idea. And so we try to use these different kind of frameworks to, to design an experience like that, using design language, visual cues, storytelling, and messaging, sort of this uh, thinking about it in terms of time. And so we do scenario planning and uh, journey mapping of all the little sort of touch points that, you, uh, that a person has throughout this journey that they're on. From before they even arrive at this Boeing facility, how are we scheduling the events and how do they learn about them and, and, and stuff to the moment you arrive and you cross the threshold of the front. Uh, narrative kind of format is really effective for making sure that the experience that you're designing and conceiving of is coherent and it's uh, consistent and it's and it's meaningful for people the, the local sports team becomes a really big part of the the fabric of a community and a lot of people's emotions and their hopes and their dreams and their ups and downs in life are attached to that team as it turns out that the the one thing that makes Ottawa sports special was actually two things. And that's red, which is sort of the national color of Canada, and black. And so these colors were uh, very much a part of the fabric of all Ottawa sports, in collegiate to professional and stuff. But to name your team Red Blacks uh, was unique. And so the last project I had was um, for a Swiss company called SpotMe. They're, they develop a mobile app. And they work in the meetings and events industry. People are sometimes hesitant to really engage with sessions when you have hundreds and if not thousands of people. How do you ask questions and really get involved with some of these big conferences that people go to? So for a long time they had developed uh, products to do this and I was tasked with trying to come up with a product launch campaign for them. But at its core it was about bringing people together and allowing people to have a shared experience and to collaborate and participate in an experience together. And so all of this led to developing a trade show booth in a very modest sort of setting. We only had a, you know, a 10 square foot kind of booth. So the hardware was also an important part of their offering, as is the app itself. Technology companies especially, it's, uh, they have a tendency to uh, talk a lot about their product, the performance, the functions. But I thought that in order to have people really invested in SpotMe and what we stood for, is I, I needed to find a different way to engage people. And so I came up with this idea for a community wall that would allow people to come into the space and, and contribute to it. And it was made up of 237 iPads, all of which were uh, connected together. And this really activated the space. And so without having to do much work, other than to create this platform that other people could come into and make their own, it generated a lot of activity. And that in itself now became your Inspire piece. That's what drew people in. And, and everything that made up this trade show booth communicated what they offer. The charge cases and storage cases, they actually sort of were integrated into the furniture. We had product demos in an environment that was really casual and comfortable. It made people want to just sit down and pick up a conversation. So people engaged with the wall. They connected with other people. They got creative and did sort of fun things. We had uh, events where we would have a giveaway. Um, but I also embedded uh, some Easter eggs in the wall itself. So at random times, somebody might go up and touch one of those iPads, and the screen would flip over, and it would say, congratulations, you just won this iPad. The theater of winning sort of an iPad, I thought it was important that they actually win that iPad, not some other one that we bring from the back. And so the salesperson would come over, and we'd actually remove the iPad, and we'd give them the box for it. And people were really excited about this. And so they would take pictures and share it on Instagram and all this other stuff. So again, just by creating a platform and allowing other people to, do, to engage with it really kind of created uh, a really uh, exciting 
kind of experience. And my team spend a lot of time thinking about how it is we get beyond just meeting, uh, satisfying people with what we do, whether it's a communications piece or an ad or a product and stuff, to get beyond sort of, we, we satisfy their basic needs, we simplify their lives in some way, but we also need to look for ways to surprise and delight people and bring some drama and suspense to, to in an unexpected way, in a really meaningful way. Um, creates for a great experience. Now, my work has awarded a lot of really interesting travel. You know, Lening was in China, so I was spending a lot of time there. The Spot Me thing was, you know, a couple of months in Lausanne, Switzerland. And, uh, but one of the things I like to do between jobs or assignments uh, or on vacations is take road trips. And road trips are great for a couple of things. One is sort of gestation time. Uh, times to kind of think of big sort of wild ideas as you're driving along and in a zone and stuff. Uh, the second thing that road trips are really great for is transitions. So whether that's just from getting from point A to point B or whether it's kind of leaving a problem behind, you know, in search of, you know, a more personal kind of solution to something. You know, I was having some challenges and I was asking some tough questions of myself. Uh, I had recognized that I was having difficulty uh, maintaining really deep kind of long-lasting relationships with people, with my friends. And I didn't quite understand it at the time, but what I came to realize is that, uh, that some of these challenges I was having um, uh, were actually related to something that I was actually quite good at. And that was understanding the needs of other people and spending a lot of time focused on those things and channeling other people's needs. I wasn't doing a very good job of of developing a strong sense of who I was. And so that creates some imbalances in relationships. You know, I could, I, I was a great listener, but not a very good communicator. You know, I could, I could give, but I couldn't receive very well. And so this kind of cropped up time to time. So ironically, there's a downside to empathy. And that's something that's called kind of the empathy trap, if you will. And so in 2010, I took off on a six month long road trip with my dog, Wesley. Yeah, hoping to kind of discover some things. And, uh, and I also wanted to see the icebergs off the coast of Newfoundland, and uh, that was a goal. So we went from Portland, Oregon, and meandered our way to the east. And, but it was a couple of months in that I arrived in my father's living room. One of the things that we tend to do whenever I visit um, is that we tend to kind of gather around that table, and we're either having playing board games like Yahtzee or Monopoly, uh, or watching Jeopardy on the television there in the living room, uh, having dinner, of course. And, um, but it was two months into my trip, and I had just arrived at uh, this table. And it's funny where you, know, you find inspiration sometimes. It comes up in some rather unexpected places, like upstate New York in a sleepy house and a table. So it was January 25th, 2011, uh, and the news was on. The recent violent uprising in Tunisia, we reported some high anxiety in the Arab world that these kinds of protests by the people against their leaders could spread. Well, today they did. Behind me here, the riot police are getting into position. All day the crowds have got bigger, and just being here is a tremendous act of bravery because the government has promised to crack down on these protests. Young and old, Christians and Muslims, students and professionals all came together for protests inspired by Tunisia's recent popular revolt. The demonstrators want to seize on the momentum for change, a moment in history they don't want to let slip by. We will not be silenced whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're an atheist. You will demand your goddamn rights and we will have our rights one way or the other. Uh, we've seen Muslims and Christians, farmers and students, office workers, factory workers, men and women, all sorts of people joining in this demonstration, which has got to be the biggest one many of us have ever seen in Egypt. Some are demanding an end to corruption, to abuse, unemployment, but above all, they want to see the end of President this uprising of the young people uh, in Egypt was tremendously inspiring to me to see uh, the passion and the courage that these kids had and the peaceful sort of solidarity that they, they seemed to 
uh, that seemed to, 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 to motivate them as well. And I was moved to go there myself and to meet some of these people and to... So the day that Mubarak was forced from power, um, I booked a plane ticket on the only airplane that I could find that was going into Egypt at that time. I took two Leica rangefinder film cameras with me. I took 60 rolls of black and white Trix film. This is on my first morning there, just walking down this street. And uh, it was very clear to me that I was no longer watching this on television. I could hear uh, the drum beats and the, and the chants and the people coming from Tahir Square that was just down the street. And so anyway, it was just a few weeks after the revolution actually began. And I was there, and I was making photographs of what would be uh, sort of this, of just sort of typical kind of civilian life and my experience with it at this really precarious kind of historic moment in time. It was very obvious to me, uh, even though I, I would understand it better later, that there was a complete power vacuum at that point. The military was kind of absent. They were just kind of checked out and fairly neutral. The people in black uh, were kind of some bad dudes. Uh, There's a lot of corruption and reports of rape and murder and other things that were going on. Um, so there was a lot of serious sort of downsides to this power vacuum that existed at that moment. But there was also a couple of little upsides, especially in a selfish sort of way. Um, which is, one is that, you know, the embassies had all closed and the tourists had vanished. And so at what point in history has there been no tourists in Cairo at the pyramids? I mean, think about it. I, 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 don't, I don't know, but maybe never. And so I, I, I went there. And, and there was nobody there. And there was nobody really that really cared what I was doing or walking around with. You know one of those old elevators where you know, you're, there is no personal space. You're just there next to people. Uh, there was an Italian woman and an Egyptian man. And the Egyptian man seemed, he was like one of these kind of guys who seems like he knows something. You know, he, he's got his finger on a pulse of what's going on. But anyway, they were talking about, as we were going up just a few flights, they were talking about some big demonstrations that were going to be happening in the square. Uh, the next the next day, they were journalists. Uh, they they run a, a, an Egyptian website, and their photographer had been sick, uh, was sick. And so I said, well, hey, you know, I, I'll give you all my pictures if you if you let me come along. Uh, with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the square at that time, and in that moment, it was it was a fairly jubilant sort of atmosphere, but it was also really intense. They were interviewing people about the prospect of upcoming sort of presidential elections. This is a brief little conference that we're having in the lobby of a decrepit old government building. We went to a series of these throughout the night. And it felt a little unsafe, because you didn't know who we were going to meet. All I knew is that these were government type people. We go into the upstairs and down sort of this labyrinth of sort of dusty old wood sort of offices and stuff. And we see men that have mysterious jobs that I didn't really know him, but it was a lot like the Godfather you would imagine to be. Um, and we arrived at sort of this main office to a minister of law, and this was his deputy. And so we sat here in his office for a little while. When I first walked into this room, I noticed a handgun on the desk, and I noticed these rosary beads that he, was, he had in his finger. So anyway, we didn't actually meet this guy named Amramosa, a potential presidential candidate that night, but I did have uh, an adventure. And over the years, I'd been looking for an opportunity to go back to the Middle East, uh, Egypt, or, or the region, and, uh, and, and do some more work like that. I had a chance sort of uh, connection with uh, uh, a communications manager for an NGO called Medair. Uh, they do relief work um, uh, where they're suffering and other kind of emergencies and stuff happening in the world. When the, the media attention goes away from a big conflict, you know, it's hard for them to get support. Uh, for their mission if you don't have good pictures and a good way to communicate the importance of the work that you're doing. And so I thought I could help with that, given my design and communications background. And they had me to Iraq this, this past summer. I went for a few weeks. And I spent most of that time embedded with the Medair teams in a variety of cities and bases throughout northern Iraq. The last few days of my stay there, I had interviewed a dozen or more displaced Iraqis that were living in a camp. Nada was one of them. And I'm going to play this kind of video here, but what you won't see in this video is that there was some kids behind my camera that were, you know, giggling and kind of distracting. And so I attempted to kind of break the ice with Nada during my short little interview. 
uh, by asking her a question that maybe in hindsight was a little naive. Her name is Nada. She's from Shamlan, Al-Hawija, and she's 12 years old. Do you have brothers and sisters? And if so, how many? I have seven sisters. And I have seven sisters, two brothers, and we have like an extra large house back there. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you need it. Uh, Pretend nobody is here. It's just you. Pretend it's just you and me. Do you have a favorite brother or sister? من بين خوات السبعة هذولا. يا واحدة من هذولا تحبيهم أكثر شيء تحبين أكثر شيء ويا وليش يعني؟ ليش تحبي أحيل؟ التوافة تحب. نحن ظل التوانسني. She said, I was deep in love with my sister that she had died that they had killed. Because she was the one who usually spends time with me. Um, what is a very nice memory you have with your sister? So I usually t uh, task her with my own task, like home chores and everything. She's done everything in my place and she would never complain. Uh -huh. As you can probably imagine, you know, I was dealing with gear and my camera and making pictures and observations of people and stuff. And during my time there, I heard a lot of really tragic stories, a lot of really graphic details. All the time, everybody had a story to tell. And uh, without fail, they were all bad. Um, it was interesting, though, because within all of those bad stories, there was also little uh, amazing things that would happen. But anyway, it wasn't really until that little moment that exchange with Nada, maybe because of who she was and how she carried herself and the conversation I was having with her, that that little exchange with that girl uh, really affected me. And, uh, and I became very present. You know, the net of what I knew about Iraq before going is that it seemed like a really bloody and scary place to me. Uh, it also seemed like it was very hot. Uh, uh, but I also assumed that I was wrong about some of that. And so I thought I would go uh, learn about that firsthand and document some of my experience. There was a few questions and kind of themes that emerged, a focus on culture, a focus on family, a focus on help um, through Medair and other folks, and then lastly, about hope. And the, it looked like time had stopped in some of these, uh, the cities that I went to, unfinished concrete buildings. And it all goes back to kind of 2014 when ISIS kind of swept through and life just stopped for these folks. Seeing families that have a really unique dynamic that I'm not really used to. Seeing girls that are very much a part of protecting the family and their communities. The only thing they could take with, from home when they escaped sort of the violence that was coming at them was some photographs. And so we spent some time flipping through some of their old photographs of their family and their memories and stuff. Holland, he was instrumental in getting his family of 25 people loaded into that small Toyota Hilux pickup truck in the town of Sinjar. And they escaped uh, ISIS through the de desert and over the mountains and stuff in that car. The help that was going on, this was a remote clinic, people lining up to see the doctor, the doctors in town and Medair's there to kind of help. And again, how people shared stories. The cell phone is really important. I look as a photographer and a designer, I look at a photograph like this and it seems quite you know, lovely. You know, the, the, just the, the textures and the colors and stuff. But you, you, and I didn't really realize that in that particular moment when I was taking this photo, what was actually going on here. Um, and all of those sheets that are covering people's patios with little holes in them was to prevent snipers, ISIS snipers, from killing them in their own homes. And then looking for signs of hope, you know, how do people kind of recover and, and have, maintain a sort of a will to kind of live, let alone sort of rebuild their lives. And so going through the town of Sinjar, a gal with a blue hat on, with a flower on her hat, and it struck me as, as, as sort of an interesting sort of juxtaposition of, of messages there. The fresh water that arrived that Medair brought in and kids playing in it. The young boys who really had it tough because they were either suspected of being ISIS members or they were ISIS members. 
And neither one of those two scenarios are good if you're in your early 20s or late teens and you're a boy. And ISIS had strict rules about all of the men. You know, they had to grow their facial hair. They couldn't cut their hair at all. And so the first act of rebellion when they were able to escape uh, was to cut their hair off. And so everybody had the same kind of haircut. So the, the, the great smiles from kids who have almost nothing uh, was quite striking to me. And sort of this universal sign of hope uh, that seemed to be everywhere. This may not have had a very significant impact on this family, but I took some photos of, of this family in their home, and one of these boys is wearing a shirt of a Portuguese football team. And they wondered, well, geez, you got these, you got these uh, you know, Iraqi boys who are in a tough place, and yet they have a sporting shirt on. And so they wondered, why is that? So they reached out to me, and we put together this article for a Portuguese kind of paper about this young boy and their family and how the shirt came to be on his, uh, his back. Seeing the cause and effect of, of a genuine ambition of mine and the interest I had in the work that I do and to see that it actually could turn into something. Uh, it seems obvious, but it, to me it was, it was quite cool. Some press of a different kind uh, is I hiked uh, the Pacific Crest Trail, 2,660 miles over the course of five months. It's on the, it goes through the mountains of California, Oregon, and Washington. And in doing that, uh, I made a video, and it kind of went viral, and there was some uh, press and stuff throughout the world that was kind of uh, telling my story in a variety of different ways. But to me, it was a selfish adventure, you know. Uh, but to realize that it could really impact other people and inspire them was, was, was quite special. They looked at this video that I made that was a series of selfies, you know, taking a picture of myself on the trail over the course of this journey. And I think people really connected with that. And they could see what they wanted to see or tried to imagine what I was feeling. You know, I was poorly prepared and overweight when I first started. And um, I assumed it would be a transformative experience. And so I wanted to capture it in some way. And the simplest way I could think of at that time, because I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, was simply to take a photo of myself. Uh, and so that's what I did. But I did it every single mile. Uh, at and as close to every single mile as possible. For somebody that kind of makes a living uh, finding solutions to problems and you know, circumventing obstacles and stuff, uh, to me it was quite important to have this, this such an unambiguous kind of challenge in front of me and it really forced me to find a way to persevere and just keep, I had to keep going. I could, there was no shortcuts. Um, I had a, lot of, had a lot of fears and anxiety going in, whether it was fear of darkness or the fear of heights a fear of running out of drinking water, um, or a fear of the rain and having too much water. All of these things sort of preyed upon my mind every single day. But the public commitment to do the hike was the scariest thing of all. One of the best lessons that I learned is that nobody, nobody can hike 2,660 miles. But I could walk 100 miles 26 times. And so that's what I did. Been a friend last night had a cup of coffee. We talked a mile on the things that have been going on. We talked a mile on the old days, we talked about the new days. We talked just about anything but what means I got. This is going trouble. south to north. So starting at the Mexico border, about two hours east of. San Diego, and mostly in mountains. Uh, the highest point was uh, about 13, uh, about 13,200 feet, if I remember correctly. And uh, this is in the high Sierras of California. It was such a big sort of thing just to get out of California. So I remember crossing into the Oregon border. Uh, was really quite thrilling. Uh, it felt like, you know, you actually achieved something. And you can see, over the course of five months, the weather changes. As you're moving further north, you're getting closer to fall, and more rain, and eventually snow.
So who would have thought that the road from Portland, Oregon would go to Cairo, Egypt in the middle of a revolution? And who would have thought that the Pacific Crest Trail would actually lead me to Iraq? Because it was because of the success of this video uh, that I made contact with that woman in communications in that area. And so a lot of things kind of happened that were um, unexpected. I, I, like I said at the beginning, because I proposed that that sort of empathetic kind of design thinking can solve pretty much any problem that ails us. And you know whether uh, you know you're trying to connect uh, a brand and its customer, or you're trying to connect with your clients, or we're trying to connect a Republican and a Democrat, or we're trying to connect the folks in this room with the people that are outside of this room. Uh, I, I believe that we can do that in, in much the same way. And, uh,